The next DNA repair mechanism that we'll take a look at is called base excision repair. Most oxidized bases, or bases that have small alterations that don't really distort the helix significantly, are removed from DNA by enzymes operating within the base excision repair, or BER, pathway. Single-stranded breaks may also be repaired through this process as they are generated as part of the process. So essentially, as the name implies, base excision repair involves the removal of the nucleotide base without removing the entire backbone or the entire nucleotide. So in this case, it's just removing the damaged guanine base, and it creates that apurinic site in this case. This abasic site can then be recognized for repair through either the long patch or the short patch mechanism. In the long patch repair, several nucleotides will be removed that include the abasic site. This region will then be resynthesized using the opposite strand as the template, and then the backbone will be repaired by DNA ligase. In short patch synthesis, the abasic site is repaired and DNA ligase will repair the backbone. Larger and bulkier adducts that distort the DNA helix require the repair mechanism known as nucleotide excision repair. When DNA is damaged by more bulky adducts, like those caused by benzoapyrene in cigarette smoke, they are typically repaired by the process of nucleotide excision repair, where the entire nucleotide is excised. There are two types of NER, global genome NER, and transcription-coupled NER. We'll discuss global genome NER here. The global genome NER can be used to detect damage throughout the entire genome, not only in areas that are actively being transcribed. In this process, the DNA damage is bulky enough to significantly alter the shape of the DNA. Xeroderma pigmentosum proteins We'll talk further about the XP proteins and how they got their name after we discuss the repair process. After the TF2H is recruited to the damaged site, RPA and additional xeroderma pigmentosum proteins join the area and cause the damaged area to bulge apart. You can see the loops created here. Additional factors are used to create a single-stranded break on the side that has the bulky adduct. You can see the single-stranded break here. This allows the complete excision of the damaged DNA. It essentially causes another DNA strand break here, and that little fragment is gonna float off where it will get degraded and chewed up back into the nucleotide bases, and the damaged base will be destroyed. The template DNA here will then be repaired by DNA polymerase and then the backbone will again be sealed by DNA ligase, repairing the bulky lesion. So the functioning of the XP proteins to maintain genomic integrity throughout the process of nucleotide excision repair is exemplified by the primary disease that results when any of the proteins involved in this process are mutated and dysfunctional. Note that the mutation must be autosomal recessive in nature with both copies of the gene being dysfunctional. This results in a condition called xeroderma pigmentosum, and you can see the discoloring of the skin in this poor boy that has this disease state. This genetic disorder results in the inability to effectively repair bulky lesions within the DNA. This includes the thymine dimers that are caused by ultraviolet light found in sunlight. Thus, people afflicted with this disease show extreme skin lesions and skin cancers. They are also prone to other forms of cancer as well. Patients suffering from this disease typically develop malignant melanomas in their early 20s, and the median age for death ranges from 29 to 37. So it's a pretty devastating disease. So the final type of DNA repair that we will consider deals with larger scale damage, such as DNA double strand breaks. Double strand breaks are a more serious type of DNA damage 
that can cause the loss of entire chromosomal segments, leading to catastrophic cellular damage. To deal with these types of damage events, the cell utilizes two major pathways, the non-homologous end-joining pathway, or NHEJ, or the homologous recombination pathway, the HR pathway. The NHEJ pathway, or non-homologous end-joining pathway, is the most common pathway utilized and involves joining two broken ends of DNA, independent of their sequence homology. NHEJ is the most active during the G1 phase of the cell cycle prior to DNA replication. It requires the activity of the Ku70, Ku80 heterodimer, which are involved in recognizing the broken ends of DNA and recruiting repair proteins and ligases to the area that will seal the break. Oftentimes, deletions or insertions will occur during the NHEJ chromosomal repair process as non-homologous ends are used to join the damaged areas. The HR pathway, in contrast, requires a homologous DNA sequence to serve as a template for the DNA synthesis-dependent repair and involves extensive DNA end processing. Repair through HR is not defined by a unique mechanism but operates through various mechanistically distinct double-stranded break repair processes, including the synthesis-dependent strand annealing mechanism, or SDSA, which requires the formation of a double holiday junction structure. So you can see it's using the homologous chromosome as a template to repair the damaged regions and join in the double-strand break. Homologous recombination pathways can also utilize the single-stranded annealing pathway that's shown on the left. The common step for homologous recombination repair of double-stranded breaks is the initial formation of single-stranded DNA that can be used for pairing with homologous DNA template sequences. For this to occur, the 5' DNA strand at the double-stranded break is processed by multiple nucleases and accessory proteins to create a 3' overhang. This can be used as the template for the recombination event. Due to their difference in mechanism, NHEJ, shown in red, can occur at any phase of the cell cycle and is most predominant in the G1 phase of the cell cycle prior to DNA replication. Homologous recombination, on the other hand, is dependent on homologous recombination and thus requires that the DNA already be in a replicated state for recombination to occur. So HR can only occur after DNA replication has occurred in S phase, G2, or right before mitosis. Homologous recombination requires the activity of numerous enzymes, such as endonucleases, that can create the 3' overhangs. In SDSA repair, which is shown here, the 3' overhang will be used to create the holiday junction with the homologous chromosome. This allows the homologous chromosome to be used as a template to recreate the damaged DNA strand, and the DNA can then be repaired. Homologous recombination occurring by the SSA method does not form the holiday junction and usually results in some amount of the DNA to be deleted from the repaired chromosome. Of note, the formation of the holiday junction is facilitated by the replacement of the RPA proteins with RAD51 along the 3' overhang of the damaged strands. This process requires the activity of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 proteins. You may have heard that certain allelic variations for the genes of these two proteins have, have been implicated in predisposing women to higher risk of breast cancer. And in fact, mice lacking key HR genes such as BRCA1, BRCA2, or RAD51 display extensive genetic alterations which lead to early embryonic lethality. 
Whereas homozygous inactivation of the HR genes is usually embryonic lethal, heterozygous inactivation of, for instance, the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene does not interfere with cellular viability, but rather predisposes individuals to cancer, including breast and ovarian cancer in mice. The tumors that develop in individuals with heterozygous BRCA1 and 2 mutations invariably lose their second BRCA1 or 2 allele, indicating that, that in certain cancers, the absence of BRCA1 or 2 is compatible with cellular proliferation. How exactly such tumors cope with their HR defect is currently not fully understood.